You finally catch a solid bass, but it's gut hooked. Do you cut the line and hope for the best, or try to save it by getting the hook out? One wrong move can kill that fish. But here's the twist. Two detailed studies looked at this exact scenario, and the best move isn't always what you think. And it's not the same for largemouth and smallmouth either. Stick around, because we're breaking it down with hard data and what the research says that gives these fish the best shot to survive and to get big. So I'm not sure there's anything more conflicting than when you catch a great big fish, get that trophy in, and then you see the darn thing is hooked really deep. And you want to catch it, get some pictures, weigh it, release it, but you want to swim away and make sure it, it survives and gets bigger. And you're always conflicted. You know, do I, do I just leave the hook in? Do I just cut it out? I mean, what, is it ever going to rust out? Is it going to block its uh, throat where it can't actually swallow? Or do I try to take it out? And at that point, do I cut the fish, tear, tear it up, and then it's actually worse off and then it dies? I'm sure you're the same as me, and over the years, you're never quite sure what to do. And actually, the research has come in for both smallmouth and largemouth, and it gives some good hard data on what is the best remedy for both, what gives them the best chance. So let's dive right into it. So in the years that I've fished, I've seen this actually change somewhat. Uh, originally, it used to always be just cut the line. You don't want to take out the hook. You're going to harm them. And that's if you've ever gut hooked one and you try to take the pliers and tear it out, I mean, you about turn them inside out. Obviously not good. Then about 2010 or so, there was a new method where you go up through the gills of a fish and then you pull that hook eye instead of it sticking up out of the mouth, you pull it through the gills back towards the tail and then you can take pliers and it just, it pops right out. It comes out pretty easily. And at that point, it seems like even though you have to go through the gills and stuff, you're actually getting the hook out. So once that new through the gill method came out, you felt better because you were taking the hook out. It came out pretty easily, especially in large mouth uh, where you have a lot of room to, to work in that big mouth. But the research wasn't, wasn't there and you're still always wondering. That's why I, I kind of dove in deep on these two studies, one in 2010, one in 2022 that followed up on the first one, and it really clears up the picture quite a bit. Still leaves some questions that I'll get into, but I think after hearing this, both for largemouth and for smallmouth, you're going to have a lot better understanding and uh, feel a little bit better about what to do. All right, so let's dive into these two studies. And the first one was done in 2010. It was on largemouth exclusively, and they wanted to test a, a few things. Like I said, the through the gill method, removing hooks was new. They wanted to test that, see if that changed anything. So let's take a look at leaving the hook in versus taking it out. Does that end up saving fish or kill some? And then secondly, over the course of a year, does that impact how much they grow? Do they get, uh, do they not grow as much? Can they not eat as much? So they studied this for a full year. So to test the deep hook, and what they did in this study is they took largemouth bass, they used live bait and kale style hooks, which are kind of rounded uh, hooks. And tell me if this sounds like your brother-in-law or buddy who doesn't fish very much. They would let the bass eat the live bait and they waited not one, not two, but three minutes before they set the hook. They want to make sure they were gut hooked. I mean, that sounds like my fishing buddies. So if I'm like, dude, he's got it, set the hook. But they were, they were gut hooked, okay? The thing is, this was uh, a little bit random, you know, how they took the fish, but they let him hold it for three minutes. Then they set the hook and they tried a few different things. So they had a control group, which they only hooked, they hooked those ones in the lip. So normal jaw type ones, as fishermen, we know this and studies prior have showed that fish hooked in the jaws and the lips, low mortality. Ones that are hooked deep, obviously the ones that struggle a lot more. So they had that group and then to take to test the uh, the fish that were gut hooked, the standard was just take the hook with hemostats, which are kind of like surgical pliers, pull out the hook, and then they also used a barbless hook that was gut hooked, but they would take those out with pliers, and then they tried uh, hook leaving it in there, cutting the line. They cut it basically two inches up above the hook, and left the hook in. And then the last method is they tried it by doing the through the gill method. So they unhooked the fish by going through the gills. So they took them out with pliers. They took them out a barbless hook with pliers. They left it in and cut the line. They did through the gills. And then they had a control where it's in the mouth. So five different groups. Now I should say that the hooks that they use, like I said, they're kale hooks, which are a little bit rounded, kind of like a EWG or something without that Z band. And they were only size two hooks. So we're talking, you know, little hooks, not your five-aught, you know, magnum flipping hook. 
and the fish that were gut hooked in the control group, they monitored them for six days to see if there was any mortality and then also for their feeding. So they put them in aquariums in mixed groups there and then they put fathead minnows in there to see how much they ate. So to check long time survival and also growth rates, they left the fish for 11 months in a pond. They let them just eat naturally out there and at two times they totally drained the pond, checked the fish for you know growth rates and stuff. They did that halfway through the study and at the end of the study. And then also at the end of the study to see if the hooks disappeared in fish that had them left in them, they took eight of them and they did a basically autopsy on them, checked them to see if the hooks were still in them or if they were totally gone. Okay, so what did they find? After 24 hours, the mortality rate with the largemouth was pretty low, actually. So the ones, the control group, where they were hooked just uh, through the mouth, the ones where they went through the grill and removed the hook, and where they also just left the hook in, of those groups, none of the largemouth died after 24 hours. The barbless hook where they removed it, 5% of those died, and then this, the barbed regular hook, 10% of those fish died. Uh, that was not statistically significant, so they couldn't conclusively say, you know, with the 95% confidence that it was different, but you can see, as you'd expect, you know, those, uh, those methods killed a few more fish, but overall, it was very low for the initial mortality. So what about for the six days, how much did they eat? So the ones that had the control group, they were just hooked in the mouth, and the ones where they went through the gills and removed the hook, those ones ate the most. The ones that had the barbless hooks that were removed, they were in the middle, and the ones that ate the very least were the ones that either the barbed hook, where they pulled that one out with pliers, or the ones where they left the hook in. Those fish ate the least. And what I found interesting there was the fact that the ones that actually had the hook left in, they actually ate more than the ones that had that barbed hook removed with the hemostats. Uh, the hook in, they still ate more. But when they looked at the time until fish started eating in each of those groups, it was really varied. It seems like obviously some of them probably had a, depending where that hook was, some had a little bigger injuries, bigger sores than other ones. And there was no statistical significance there on when they started eating again, just because it was so random and so variable based on basically most likely how badly were they, they injured when they got hooked. Now they also looked at how long are they out of water taking the hook out. And most people are pretty quick about all these methods. Cutting the line is the quickest, taking it through the gills or trying to take pliers or hemostats and get out a gut hooked one. That took the longest, but in all the cases, basically the amount of air exposure was not long enough to do harm to the fish if the, the person doing it was trained and, and knew how to remove the hooks. So if you're a proficient fisherman, the time out of the water was not a consideration. But with fish being slower to eat and eating different amounts, did that impact their long-term survival? Interestingly, not really. Long-term survival at both the fall draining and then the summer one, it was pretty much identical. There was no difference across the board there. The growth rates, no differences either. And then what they looked at were they took eight fish and they did an autopsy on them and basically checked those to see if the hooks were still in them after those 11 months. In all of those, the fish that still had the hook in them they were gone in every single fish. So based on those results, what did the researchers conclude? Basically, they said short-term mortality was low across all hook removal methods. Basically, not many died. The ones where you ripped out the hook that had a barb on it, that was the highest one, or even the barbless one. But basically, it was, that wasn't even statistically significant. That could be random variation there. So pretty much with the largemouth, all methods in the short term were about the same. And then with the rest of the study, well, like we saw there, really the, the feeding comes on quicker when the hook is, is removed through the gills or they're only jaw hooked. But basically overall, the whether they start feeding within a day or six days, whether they eat a lot in those first few days, the long-term survival and the long-term growth rate, they overcame that short little period. All of the fish got rid of the hook over the course of 11 months, whether they shook it out or if it just rusted out, whatever happened, they got rid of it eventually. And the growth rates and survival was basically the same for all groups. So basically the, the handling with the largemouth, whether you cut the line, whether you pulled it out, whether you went through the gills, it was basically the same outcome. So in 2022, some researchers primarily based in Ottawa, Canada, took a look at this and said, great study, 
appreciate what you did here, but there are quite a few variables that we'd like to control more uh, with the eating the live bait, you know, how they randomly took it. The hook's not always in the same spot. Let's try to control some of these variables. Plus, hey, smallmouth have a lot smaller jaw and gills than largemouth. You know, let, or before we say this works with all bass and stuff, let's do a little tighter study. Let's tighten it up, look at a few more of the variables, try to rein those in, make it more consistent, and also test on smallmouth and see what happens here because some of the findings kind of went against some of the research that was out there already. And a lot of that research was saying that if you cut the line for most species of fish versus monkeying around and getting in there, removing deep hooks, even with this new method, it probably works out better if you just leave the hook in there the way we used to do it. So let's see what the new research found. Now this study controls a lot and like I said, takes out some of the variation of letting, waiting three minutes before you set the hook on the fish before you gut hooked them. It only looked at it for 24 hours though. It didn't look at the long-term growth, but they were looking at initial mortality. And I think I'd be a little surprised at what the initial mortality was with smallmouth. Like I said, this makes you rethink all of it basically. But they took five groups. So the control group in this one, again, it's a jaw hook, it's not a deep hook. Then they also used barbed hooks and barbless. So they did both barbed and barbless using those with the, the removal up through the gills. So a barbed one and then also barbless that way. And then they also tried cutting about six inches of line where the line actually went out of the mouth and leaving the hook in. Now these weren't kale hooks, these were like Ned style hooks because I mean, it's a small mouth and it's 2022. What else are you going to use, right? But they that's the five different groups. So they had one in the jaw. They tried the barbed and barbless going through the gills. And then they also tried, let's just go ahead and leave them in and see what happens. They didn't do the standard, like take the pliers and rip it out method. Now, again, with these, they made sure the hooks all went in the same exact spot. So they put them deep hooked, but they put them in the exact same spot in every fish. And then they tested them for 24 hours. They wanted to see the, the fish's reflexes during the period at a number of times, see if they were impaired at all. And then they looked really close up too to see if there was bleeding and any tearing, what actual damage there was. And then they also checked at the end of it to see how many actually got rid of the hook in, in 24 hours, were half the hooks gone or were all of them or, or none of them. Now, the first thing that they found was talking about the barbless hooks versus the, the regular ones. And I think you know, that's more trout fishermen, a lot of fly fishermen stuff go barbless, maybe not as much with the, with bass fishing, but there was a big difference. When they went through the gills and removed them, the barbless hooks on average, these were, you know, skilled uh, people trained in it. They could remove the hook in about nine seconds. If it was a barbed hook, it was about 25 seconds to get it out. So obviously you can see that little barb there. I mean, from my standpoint, I'm trying to keep everyone, <laughs> keep everyone buttoned up. So it's like, you know, I, I want the barb there, but it is amazing how just that little barb, and of course, if you've ever hooked yourself, you know how hard it is to get that hook out. But that's a pretty appreciable difference there, that nine seconds versus 25 seconds to get it out. Now, when they removed the hooks, and remember, this isn't just sticking pliers down their throat and ripping it out real forcefully. This is kind of the trained way going through the gills and gently taking it out there. There was a lot of damage done to these smallmouth uh, when they took the, the hook out. Didn't necessarily kill them, but there was definitely damage. 40% had gill damage, 30% had uh, bleeding, 3% had esophageal tears, and loss of burst reflex, 40% had that uh, impaired, 20% had a loss of equilibrium. And when you take the, the barbed ones, which all of us are using versus the barbless, I mean, they were at the high rates. It's like uh, incidence of bleeding, it was 30% for the barbed versus 8% for the barbless and the esophageal tear, you're looking at 39% versus like 6% for the barbless. So when there's, it's a barbed hook and you're taking it out in these small mouth, even if they don't die, they're getting some pretty considerable damage where you're getting tearing and bleeding or loss of equilibrium. And let's talk about mortality too. Here's a huge difference. You know, small mouth to me, at least in live well and stuff, aren't quite as hardy as large mouth. You know, it's a pretty hardy fish versus like a trout or something. But uh, you remember in the largemouth study, most of them, there were zero deaths. When they took them out with forcibly with pop pliers, remember the barbless hooks, you had 5% died and like 10% of the ones when you ripped it out with pliers, the hemostats would die in the largemouth. Well, when you talk about through the gill removal with a barbed hook, like a regular Ned, I mean, these are just Ned hooks, but a regular hook, 24% of the smallmouth, a quarter of them died within 24 hours. 
even with the barbless ones, 8% were dying when they removed it, going through the gills. Now, when they left it in the barbed hook, uh, again, smallmouth not quite as hardy, 14% of them died. So that's that's quite a bit. Obviously, the deep hook and the smallmouth seem to have a, a major impact. The barbless, when it was left in, only 4%. And the fish, when they're hooked in the jaw, none of them died in 24 hours. So obviously with the smallmouth, the deep hook's a problem. You know, the barb is doing some damage. And if it's a barb deep and then you remove it and you get the tearing, not good. Then what about the hooks? How many, you know, these smallmouth, they're pretty active, pretty mean. They'll, they'll shake and, and go crazy and stuff. How many got rid of the hooks in 24 hours? Of the 41 fish where they left barbs in them or left hooks in them, only two of them got rid of them, and both of those were the barbless. Remember, these are just the little Ned, Ned Rig hooks, so we're not talking a huge one, but only two of them got rid of them, and like I said, it's only the barbless. So based on this study, and especially with the smallmouth, a little bit different results here, so what do the researchers conclude here? And the first one being that air exposure, again, it takes longer to take out a hook versus cutting the line, but none of these methods, if you knew what you're doing, on none of them was the air exposure the determining factor. If it took a little bit longer, it stressed the fish a little bit, but mortality had no difference. And basically any of these methods, it doesn't matter how long it takes, they were all quick enough to get the fish back into the water soon enough. And then when it comes down to leaving the hook in versus taking it out, whether it's barbed or not, it was pretty conclusive with smallmouth here. Whether you killed it or you just did damage, taking the hook out, even going through the gill method, removing it where it would pop out pretty easily, did way more damage, killed way more fish, barbed or not. Remember, you were talking like 40% like bleeding and tearing when you were taking it out. Mortality rate, uh, taking it out through the grills like 24% versus 14% for barbed hooks. And with the, the barbless, it's still like 14% versus, uh, excuse me, 8% versus 4.5%. It's considerably higher. So with the smallmouth, it was pretty conclusive here. Cut the line, and they were cutting these longer. Like I said, it was 6 inch partly because they wanted to see if it had passed or gone anywhere. But I've also heard the philosophy is if you leave a longer section of line, that when they eat, it can kind of, that guides and food can still get down their gullet. I'm not sure if that's conclusively proven, but I've seen that advocated by fisheries biologists saying that if you leave a longer section of line, like this six inch, that it helps guide the prey so the hook doesn't block the throat. And especially with these smallmouth leaving the six inch in, Seemed like it didn't impair them, at least in 24 hours. So where does that leave us? And I think a couple things stand out clear here. Obviously with the smallmouth, like we just said, going through the gills, probably not a great idea. Cutting it and uh, and leaving that long line there is the best to do. Now, if this is a great big crankbait or something, it's going to block their whole throat. Then you have to weigh the thing. Like if it's blocking the whole mouth, it's down in there and they're never going to be able to eat anything. They're going to starve to, get to death. At that point, you may have to take it out. Obviously, with that smaller mouth, then it just gets tough with the, the trying to get pliers or hemostats in there. But I think with small mouth, if we're talking single hooks and stuff, going through the gills does not seem like a great method on them. Cutting the line seems like a better solution. Now, the large mouth, a little bit more complicated. I would say this. They did show that even though in the short term, it's a little bit different results. If you cut the line with them, the long-term growth rates and survival is the same across the board on the, on with largemouth. So again, if it's not blocking their throat, if you're not that skilled, if you're not really uh, comfortable with going through the gills and taking it out or something, if you're more of a novice fisherman, cutting the line seems like a good solution. They eventually spit the hook, they end up growing the same. It seems like it's all right. If you're familiar with it and experienced, remember the, the short-term survival rate was the same on these and it's gonna depend on the fish. If it's a great big hook, like I said, a flipping hook, it's a it's a big lure down there or something like that. You know, you don't wanna leave like a, a big flipping jig or something that's real deep that's gonna block their whole gullet where they can't swallow. I think at that point, it probably makes sense because like I said, if the survival rate, the growth rate seems the same either way. Large mouth, a little bit more hardy. They have a big mouth, especially like a big five pounder or something. You can go through the gills pretty easily without tearing it up. So I think that's a case by case basis. If you're not comfortable with it, feel fine cutting the line there. It seems like the large mouth are gonna do well based on the study. If it's something you're afraid it's gonna block their gullet, not be able to swallow, they're hardy fish, go through the gills, turn the bait around and take the hook out and feel good about releasing that fish. So hopefully it helps you out, release a few more fish so they can grow up so we can catch them again, worry about taking the hook out the next time we catch them when they're two pounds bigger.